coming in hot and heavy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is my, my privilege to be with you guys um, this weekend. And I, I, I don't, I'm sure that I'm not the nicest guy in the fellowship. I'm confident that that's Jay Shug. But um, that, that I know. But um, what, what Code said is true that I have been for you guys from the beginning, and I've followed from afar off and, and, and have got to know Neil and Debbie and Code, and, and, and that's, that's been a real joy. Um, and, and we've watched you guys from afar. We've prayed for you guys um, and still do. And, um, man, it's, 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 cool, it's cool to be with you. And so um, it, it's, it's, it really is my honor. Uh, I'm also t- excited to, to talk to you about about what we're going to look at uh, over this weekend, over these next few days. I suspect most of you uh, know the plan for this conference, or at least the broad topics that we're going to be studying. The, the Legacy Conference is obviously about leaving a legacy for Christ. And this week, we're going to see how that legacy plays out in the life to come, so to speak, when our faith turns to sight. So what we're going to be studying falls under the umbrella of of what some people call eschatology. And that just means end times or the doctrine of last things after, for us, what we're going to be looking at after the rapture of the church. So we're going to be talking about some of the details with respect to judgments and our possible rewards and our inheritance and things like that. And it's all cool stuff. It's exciting stuff. But here's what I want you to get from the very beginning Because the the truth is, much of the life to come, or at least our faith in it, is dependent upon what we do and how we live in this life today and our obedience to God's word today. You see, the point of understanding what is to come is so that it changes how we live today and changes how we live tomorrow and the rest of our lives. Because the truth is, we are going to live forever, but our role in, in what that life is going to look like in the hereafter is largely determined by the decisions we make in what James calls this vapor of a life. In what Paul calls in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, a moment. But please understand the importance of this vapor the importance of this moment, it can't be overemphasized because it affects eternity. And just think about that. We're going to be talking about the millennium, a thousand years, an eternity. And that is drastically affected by a moment, by a vapor. And so we have to get this down and we have to understand what God is calling each and every one of us to do. So we're going to approach these topics through, through each one of our sermons from that angle, from the perspective of what are we doing today to prepare for what's next. Because I want you to understand that this life is all about investing wisely. This life is all about investing wisely. And Jesus told us how to do it. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. You see, we're to lay up treasures in heaven, not on this earth. Who cares? At the end of the day, who cares if you leave a legacy down here? That won't last. But you know what, Will? Living in service to the Lord, doing his work, fulfilling his mission. And honestly, there's nothing else worth doing. You're wasting your life if you're not doing that. Why do you want to spend your life investing everything you have in these 40 or 60 or 80 or maybe even 100 short years? It's a vapor. It's a moment. And there's an eternity after that. So the question I'm going to ask you this entire weekend is this. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you prepared for what's to come? Because one way or another, this life on earth is coming to an end for all of us. 
And I believe it's coming to an end sooner rather than later. So are you prepared for that to happen? And then in conjunction with that, do you know what's next? Because that will help you be prepared for what's coming. And what's coming next in in our primary subject that we're going to focus on tonight is the judgment seat of Christ. Because after the rapture of the church, the next event for believers in Jesus Christ in God's prophetic timeline is the judgment seat of Christ. Now, to set the context for this study, you need to know that that there are multiple judgments found in the Bible. Many of you are probably aware of that. Maybe maybe some of you aren't. But, But there is not just one general judgment. Right? That's what most of the world thinks if, if they believe in, in a God at all. And that general judgment in their mind is that proverbial scale, right? And it's, is their good weighed against their bad? And the thinking is, if, if I do good enough or if I've done enough good things, if, I ha- if, if my good side weighs more than my bad side, then, then I'll get to go to heaven, even though they have no idea what that means or what that looks like. And whenever folks think like that, they always want to measure themselves against the lowest scoundrel they know. It's like, well, I'm, okay, I'm, not, I'm not that good, but at least I'm not that dude. I mean, have you seen what he's been doing lately? And that gets to the problem with this line of thinking, and that's the standard. Because the only standard the Bible puts forth that we are to measure ourselves against is Jesus Christ. So perfection, and that's problematic for this general judgment thought. I don't care how many good works you have, it's not enough, because you're not Jesus. But aside from that, it's wrong from the jump anyway, because one general judgment is not what the Bible lays out. Like I said, there are many judgments in the Bible. Most people of our ilk break it down into seven judgments. I personally count them a little bit differently. I have nine. I think nine's a popular uh, number around here, so maybe that, that fits in. Um, but, but we're not here to work, work through all that, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you break it down in seven or nine or, or ten or eleven, as long as you understand that God does different things at different times with different people. So what is true of dispensations, for example, is true of judgments as well. And this is important to understand because like dispensations, not all of the judgments deal with us. There's multiple judgments in the Bible. We don't don't have to go through all of them. So, for example, there's the judgment of the nation of Israel. This is what we commonly refer to as the tribulation. And there are multiple Bible references for this. It's it's the theme of Revelation 6 through 19. It's talking about the tribulation. There's the judgment of the Gentile nations. This is what's sometimes referred to as the sheep and goats judgment. At the end of the tribulation, and your primary passage for that is Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. There's the judgment of Satan and his armies at the end of the millennium. That's found in Revelation 20, verses 9 and 10. Now, some people don't actually count this one, but I do, and I'm up here, so so I'm counting it. Um, Then we have the great white throne judgment, the judgment of the unsaved dead. Also, you find that in Revelation chapter 20. That's going to be our topic Sunday morning, so we'll, we'll talk about that in some detail. And then, in connection with, or at least somewhat related to the great white throne, with respect to timing, at least in my opinion, is the judgment of angels. The Bible says we're going to have a role in that. You see that in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3. It says, know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? And also at that time is the judgment of the tribulation and the millennium saints. So those that came through the tribulation came out of the millennium that are saved well, they still have to face a judgment. And, and when you compare Revelation chapter 20 to Daniel chapter 7, you see some of that judgment break down. Also in, in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18 specifically as well. And so you can cut and dice those a few different ways, depending on how you want to look at it. But there are three others, and these three, they do deal directly with us. So first, there is the judgment of sin that was placed on Jesus Christ at Calvary. So when Jesus died, he died for your sins and for mine, and he took our judgment upon him. And if you have appropriated that to yourself by placing your faith in him and his finished work, then you are saved. And praise the Lord for that. And praise the Lord for this one, because this one brings about our salvation. 
But then second, there's another judgment that we call the believer's self-judgment. 1 Corinthians 11.31, for example, says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And if we will daily judge our own selves and our own lives according to the standard of God's word, then we keep our account short with the Lord. And we could walk with him in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's our biblical sanctification. So we have a judgment that deals with, for our salvation. There's one that deals with our biblical sanctification to keep us walking in the Spirit. And then there's this crazy little thing called the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ ultimately judges the Christian service. So we're dealing with salvation, sanctification, and service. And we see this judgment, you find it a few different places in the Bible. You find it in Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. It says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Again, Romans, church age book, talking to the believers there. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, all believers. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. You also see it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. Paul says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For Again, for we must all, all Christians, he's writing to the church at Corinth, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we're made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So we're going to dive into this one tonight, the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment for our service to the Lord on this earth. And I want you to ask yourself, am I ready? Am I ready for this judgment? Because if you are a Christian, if you are a saved, born-again believer, you're going to be there. It's a 100% guarantee, for we must all appear. So are you ready for what is to come at the judgment seat of Christ? I phrased it this way in my title for tonight's sermon, Are You Ready for the Revealing of Fire? Because we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Those are the three primary passages for the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to spend most of the night tomorrow night in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, really focusing on the rewards and what we can earn. But, but look at what 1 Corinthians 3.13 says. Speaking of the judgment seat of Christ, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So this judgment is serious business, and we need to make sure that we are ready and we're going to check out our readiness from a passage that we don't always connect with the judgment seat of Christ. But, but I believe is one of the most relevant passages re- related to this judgment. And it's 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. In fact, these verses are going to provide a basis for much of what we look at this weekend. We're going to just try to lay a foundation tonight. We're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to talk about it again tomorrow night. And then we're going to try to connect some dots both Saturday and Sunday with what, we're, what the foundation we're laying here in 2 Timothy chapter 4 tonight. Uh, but So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to go ahead and turn there with me, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 6 through 8, and then, then we'll ask the Lord to bless our time together. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6, the Bible says, this is Paul speaking. He says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto them also that love is appearing. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are, we are so thankful uh, for your word tonight. We're so thankful for the fellowship we have through your Son. And so, Lord, I just pray that... that that you come and be with us tonight. I pray that, the, that, that you do the work, that your Holy Spirit does the work that only he can do to convict and convince our hearts and that your word does the work that only it can do to, to just to, to mold us and to change us uh, how we need to be changed. Lord, we're so thankful for the opportunity we have 
in this life to serve you. And so, Lord, I pray that we do make the most of it uh, for your glory. Lord, I pray that everything that's said tonight is true to your word. I pray that it is honoring and glorifying to you and the entire service is a sweet savor and to you, Lord. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I, I know for many of you, if you've been around church very long, this, this passage is kind of well-worn territory. These are popular words from, from Paul, particularly verse 7, right? I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. And we've heard the, the, these words quite often. But tonight, I, I hope to look at them in, in a little differently, a little different light than normal, and, and shine maybe a new light on them with respect to the judgment seat of Christ, because I, be, I do believe they are key in understanding this judgment and, and key in helping you, first of all, point number one, assess your readiness, right? So that's what we're here. I'm, I'm talking about, are you ready? And so we need to be able to make an assessment. We, we need to know, well, okay, well, ready for what? What is it that I need to be ready for? And so verse 6 helps us assess that. I want you to look at it again and see exactly what Paul says and pay attention to the words. He says, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure at hand is at hand. So Paul is at the end of his life. This is the last epistle he writes. And he's, he's, he's given Timothy, his young disciple, kind of his final charge. This is the last chapter of this epistle. And he's at the end of his life and he understands it and he's okay with it. Because he says, I'm now ready. I'm ready. I'm ready for what is is to come next. And Paul was ready because of two words that we see in this verse. And I think these two words will help us assess our own individual readiness. And the first word we need to look at is offered. Paul said, for I am now ready to be offered. And historically, Paul was about to be martyred and and was, in fact, martyred shortly after the writing of this epistle. History tells us that he was beheaded in Rome sometime in the late 60s A.D. So when Paul says he was ready to be offered, what he meant was that he was ready to offer himself as a sacrifice to the Lord. He was going to be a martyr. And listen, our readiness to face the Lord and his revealing fire at the judgment seat is also tied to our willingness to be offered as a sacrifice to him. But that doesn't just apply to dying for Christ, like Paul. It involves living Unto Christ, like Paul. You probably know Romans 12, 1, where he calls it being a living sacrifice our reasonable service. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And if you are a living sacrifice, then you are in service to Him. It is a reasonable service. And our service to the Lord are our works to the Lord, our works for the Lord. And again, that is what is going to be judged at the judgment seat, our obedience and our submission to God's word. Are you living dead to yourself and alive unto him and all that he says? Because remember, you won't be judged for your sins. And sometimes you, we, lose, we lose concept of that and we lose our, our bearings with that. We, even if we know it, we somehow think, okay, well, well we're, yeah, but man, if we're, if we're living a, an unholy life, we're going to be judged for that. Well, okay, so God might judge you for that in this life. And if you're living an unholy life, you're not being a, 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 a service to him and living a sacrificial life for him. So that's going to play out in the judgment seat, but you're not being judged for your sins. Those were judged at Calvary. We're going to be judged for what we did or didn't do. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, in the context of the judgment seat, it says, wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And so, you know, we talk all the time about how salvation is free. And it's true. 
we know that we don't work to be saved. But we certainly are saved to work. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, For by grace ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Absolutely not. Lest any man should boast. But, verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. As we walk in his word, as we live out his word, those are the good works that we're to do. You see, at the point you get saved, you become a new creature. You know this, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us that. And we're a new creature because we are a son of God. Okay, and this is important. Sons of God were created to work. The very first son of God created in the the Bible is Adam. We see Luke 3.38 refers to Adam as the son of God. In Genesis 2, God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden with a job to do. Genesis 2.15 says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. He was placed on this earth to work, and so are we. Wherefore, we labor. Is what 2 Corinthians 5.9 tells us. And the specificity of the labor that we are to do, we're going to get into in our next point, and and really tomorrow night. That's really going to be the focus of tomorrow night. But you need to know now that when you stand before Jesus Christ at that revealing of fire, your works are going to be judged. And they will be revealed, whether good or bad, of what sort they are. And it will lead to reward or it will lead to loss. But this is what our life is to be. Look at what Paul told the church at Philippi in in Philippians 2.16. He said, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Okay, the day of Christ is a key phrase in the Bible that that, that specifically refers to the rapture of the church and the judgment seat immediately following. He says that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain. Paul said, above all, I don't want my life to be a waste. I don't want everything to be vain, to be empty. I want my life to be about something bigger than me. And he goes on to say in the next verse, in verse 17, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. So in order to assess your readiness... You have to assess your willingness. Are you willing to be offered as a living sacrifice to the Lord? Giving up what your flesh wants for what he commands. And the word offered is an interesting one. It's it's used 28 times in the New Testament. And 26 of those 28 times it, it refers to a sacrifice. Now sometimes... The sacrifice was was to God, and other times it was to idols, but either way, a sacrifice was involved. It's the same in the Old Testament. So we see it from the very beginning with Cain and Abel. We see it with Abraham and Isaac. Hebrews 11, 17 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, that he had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. And so sometimes in both Old Testament and New Testament, the sacrifice was to God, like Abel and Abraham. Other times it wasn't, or it wasn't acceptable to God, like Cain. And that tells me something. And it tells me that your willingness and my willingness isn't about if. It's about who. You see, the question isn't if your life will be a sacrifice. The question is, upon whose altar will you lie? And some Christians think, well, man, I, you know, I, I, sure, I want my judgment to go well. I don't know if I can give my life to the Lord in that way. And if you think that, can I ask you why you would rather give it to the world and to your flesh and to the, and to the devil where there's nothing in return? Nothing but heartache? And the one true God is asking you to give to him based on what he has already given to you. 
See, those enemies just want to take, and they want to rob, and they want to steal. And God's given. And we're going to look at the rewards available tomorrow night. But listen, he didn't even wait for you to do it first. He did it first. Hebrews 10, 12 says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And he loves you so much that he wants a relationship with you built on mutual sacrifice. He allows you to enter into that relationship for free based solely on what he has done. But to build that relationship into the love story he longs for, and he wants your submission. He wants your life. But he's given you a free will, so he's given you the option to say no. But just know that he's already said yes. And he's already done his part. And in doing his part, he showed us exactly how to do ours. And he's always been clear on this. There's no bait and switch with the Lord. You develop an intimate relationship with him and thereby are ready for the judgment seat of Christ by taking up your cross just as he took up his and living unto him in his service through his word. And remember, it's reasonable, but there are no shortcuts. Luke 9, verses 23 and 24, and he said unto them all, that any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the, shame, the same shall save it. You see, we become a living sacrifice as we die to our flesh every day. And we live unto God through what his word says. And that's a door that we have to walk through every day. Christ did it once, we do it daily. And I use that terminology of being a door that we walk through every day very intentionally because there's a beautiful picture there that you need to understand. And some of you might know this, but the cross is likened to a door and it's likened to doorposts, right? We see this initially with the Passover story in Exodus chapter 12. As the children of Israel were getting ready to leave Egypt, God is going through all the plagues, and he gets to the last one. He's going to kill the firstborn of everything. But God gave the instruction to the children of Israel to take a special lamb without blemish and to sacrifice, to sacrifice it and to put its blood where? On the wooden doorpost of their house. And when God saw the blood on the doorpost, he would pass over that house and not smite their firstborn. And there's a prophetic picture of the blood of Jesus on the cross. And when we accept it and when we apply it to our life, our sins are passed over and forgiven. And God accepts the sacrifice of his son on our behalf, just like he accepted the sacrifice of that lamb without blemish in Exodus chapter 12. So the doorpost pictures the cross, the cross of Jesus. But then a few chapters later, there's another doorpost that pictures a cross. And it's another picture of Jesus, but this one is a little bit different because it's a picture of us too, as we willingly pick up our cross. So the Passover is, is just Jesus. That's, that's the picture. Now we're going to see a, a picture of us, and this is found in Exodus 21. And it's the law of the Hebrew servant, and I want you to see it starting in verse 1. Exodus chapter 21, verses 1 through 6, it says, now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, so they're going through the law and they're laying out, out the details for, for the servanthood. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve. And in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. But now, now listen to this in verse 4. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her master's. And he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he shall bring him to the door or under the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So I think you know the story, but 
But this is the laying out the law for the Hebrew servant. They would serve six years, and the seventh year they could go free. But if the master had given him his wife and he had children, they still belonged to the master. And so this servant in that seventh year had a choice. He had a choice to make. Was he going to go free and leave his wife and, and kids at home? Or he had the option to say, I love my master. I love my wife. I love my kids. I'm, I'm going to serve you forever. And to signify that, they would take him to a doorpost. And they would take an awe. And they would hammer it through the ear. And they would put an earring in. And that signified that he was going to stay with that master forever. And this Hebrew servant is a picture of Jesus because of his willingness to be nailed to a doorpost. Because of his love for his bride and his love for his children. John 10, 7, Jesus calls himself the door for his sheep. But beyond that, it is a picture of you and me and our choice of being a living sacrifice and taking up our cross or not. You get to choose. The servant gets to choose. It takes a willingness. But if you're willing, oh, you're ready And you're not only ready to meet the Lord, you are ready to experience a life of fulfillment that was before unimaginable. It's the only life worth living. And it will leave a lasting, eternal legacy. It's back to what Paul said in Philippians Philippians 2. It's the only thing that makes life mean something. And listen, when you take up your cross, you are conforming your life to Jesus. And guess what? We can please God the Father through our service, just like Jesus did through his. You see, when God looked down at Jesus after his baptism, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And when Jesus offered himself on the cross, God was pleased with and accepted that sacrifice. He turned his back on his son because his son became sin. But we know he accepted the sacrifice because he rose again. And there's coming a day, a day of revealing fire, that we have the opportunity to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful, what? Servant. A servant that willingly laid his body up against the wooden doorpost. And when you connect your life to Christ through this offering, you become a conduit of God to work through you in a way that will leave a legacy. And you can be like Paul who said in Galatians 6, 17, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He said, man can't hurt me. I've got a hole in my ear. I went to the doorpost. You can see it. I'm a servant for life. And bad boys for life, man. Let's do this thing. So the first word to help you assess your readiness is offered. Are you offering your life willingly and daily? And what's that mean? It means you're living by what this book says. Have you gone to the doorpost and put your life aside and said, I'm I'm willingly going to serve Christ with the rest of mine? Have you given your life to him just like he has given his life to you? But there's another word in this verse that will help you assess your readiness to meet the Lord. And then this one will be quick. But that word is departure. Paul said the time, I'm ready to be offered, the time of my departure is at hand. So, So the first key word offered was about service through sacrifice. This key word is about perspective. You see, offered was about this physical life and how you live out your life while on this earth in service to him and submission to his word through your labor to him that's going to be judged. But departure is about your spiritual life and how you view what's to come. And, And here's what I mean by that. Is your view of leaving this earth an ending or a beginning? Because I want you to pay attention to what Paul said and what Paul didn't say. What Paul said was, the time of my departure 
is at hand. He didn't say, the time of my death is at hand. You see, departure is a beginning. It's a start of a new journey. Excitement is in the air. But death is an ending. Sadness is in the air. So when you think about the judgment seat of Christ, I want you to take a second and I want you to take your mind there as much as you can. And when you think about the judgment seat and seeing Jesus face to face, what is the first hint of emotion you feel? Is it excitement or dread? Because that provides some insight for you. And listen, I get it. It's probably both. It's probably somewhere in the middle. It would be great to see him and see him face to face. But we're being judged too in what 2 Corinthians 5 calls the terror of the Lord. But listen, I mean, here's the thing. At the end of the day, a judgment isn't bad if you're prepared. It's just like a test in school. If you didn't study and you aren't prepared, you dread it. And you have reason to dread it. But if you put in the work and you're ready, well, it can kind of be exciting. You look forward to the good grade, to the commendation you know you're going to receive. You see, Paul was about departure and not death. He was ready. He was so ready. I mean, you see this all throughout Paul's life. And listen, Paul was special. I, I, I get it. Paul's our model. We're going to talk about that some this week. And so it's what we should aspire to. But I get it. Paul was a special character. But look at what he says in Philippians 1.21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then down in verse 23, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And this was the internal battle of Paul on wanting to depart to be with the Lord, but knowing that God still had work for him down here. And I, I, man, that, just, that right there just defines someone who's ready. Listen, our problem, my problem is usually the opposite. I have an internal battle. But it's not wanting to depart because I got more work I got to get done. I feel like I'm behind. We usually feel like we haven't done enough for the Lord. And honestly, that's not even the issue. It's never been about how much we do. It's all about our willingness to be an offering. How much we live out this book. That's what it is. That's it. And if you're willing to go to the doorpost and walk in his word, you're ready for the judgment seat. And you can say like John did in the next to last verse of the Bible, he which testifies these things say, as surely come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. That's being ready. And then you prove your readiness. So that helps you assess it and helps you frame it. Am I living my life? Am I dying to my flesh? Am I going to the doorpost? Am I, am I walking in his word? And that, okay, so that helps you frame it. And how do I view life? What, what do I view th th what's to come? Do I view it with excitement? Do I view it with dread? And I, and I get it that it's both. But that's going to help you make some assessments. But here's how you prove if you're ready or not. And this is point number two. And this is you accept your responsibility. I mean, here's the bottom line, and there's just no way to get around it. If we're being judged for our works, then we are responsible to do work. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how much easier to say it. Like, we can't just go through life and say, well, I mean, I think I'm going to live a good life and, and I'm going I'm to just hope for the best when I see him. I, that's probably not the best plan. I, I think you should put plan B in place, which would be to actually work in service to him under the responsibilities you have. Look at verse 7. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. This is why he was ready, because he could say these things. Now, now we're not going to take the time this evening to really dig into the responsibilities here of fighting a good fight, finishing your course, and keeping the faith, because we're, we're really going to focus on that tomorrow night. And I'm going to show you how these three things are connected to the three rewards, gold, silver, precious stones, and how they're also connected to our three enemies that are fighting to keep us from... from from getting these rewards and doing these things. So we're, we're going to break them down one by one tomorrow night and compare them in, in those ways. But listen, 
this right here, this is the crux of everything. This was Paul's summary of his life, these three simple statements. Like I said, Paul is our model, and so these are a big deal. And it doesn't matter if you think you're ready or not. Verse 7, 2 Timothy 4, 7 is the answer. Because if you're ready, it's what you do to stay ready. And if you're not ready, it's what you start doing to get ready. This is what success looks like in the Christian life. And I think we all desire that. Now, we certainly also have competing desires that, that take over too many times. But for most Christians, I think we want and desire success in serving the Lord. I mean, you know, success in, in life in general is a desire built into us innately. You know, there probably aren't too many of us who say, you know what, I hope to be a failure. <laughs> hope to not really get anything accomplished in this life. Well, hopefully that doesn't describe you. You know, you see those keychains or, or coffee mugs that have, you know, a name on them and then a description. It's like, you know, Troy, warrior, you know, or whatever. You know, I haven't seen too many that say, like, like Troy, untrustworthy. You know, I don't care how true it is. I'm not going to be drinking my morning coffee from something that says, you know, Troy, lazy. You know, I'm just, I'm just not. I don't want that. I desire success. In all areas of life. And verse 7, 2 Timothy 4, 7, is complete success in life by definition. It is a lifetime of putting Joshua 1, 8 into practice. And Joshua 1, 8 is the only time the word success is found in the Bible. If you're not familiar with that verse and how you achieve true success, you should look it up when you, should, when you get home. And you should compare it to 2 Timothy 4, 7. And those two verses line up very, very neatly. Because success is found through fighting and finishing and keeping the faith. And the fact is, you will be rewarded in that day based on how well you did these three things. And listen, it's a fight, and nothing is fair in a fight, or I, I should say everything is fair in a fight. So we have to fight hard and run hard and hold on too hard. And we have to keep the faith, which, which we're going to see is the word. And we got to keep it tenaciously with violence clear to the end. And the reason why is because there are foes are out there and they don't want you to. And they, 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 want, they hate this book. We see it in our culture. We see it in society. And our foes aren't people. I mean, they're, you know, the people we see on TV, that, that's not who we're really fighting. We have spiritual enemies. A loose devil on the outside, a seducing world on the outside, and a traitorous old nature on the inside. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's who we fight against. And so we have enemies without and within that are trying to defeat us, they're trying to stop us, and they're trying to detour us. So to see success, the success that Paul lays out in verse 7, it's going to take some spiritual discipline, and it's going to take some strategy, some exercise, some belief, and we're going to talk all about it tomorrow. But here's, here's the bottom line. In the course of the New Testament, Paul lays out the battle doctrine necessary to defeat those foes. And we know that ultimately we win because we're on the right team. And additionally, personal success is guaranteed by the cross, but it's not automatic. It's guaranteed if you do what it says. If you, fight, if you die to yourself, if you crucify yourself, if you crucify yourself to this world, there's guaranteed success. It's just not automatic. You have to put in the work. And that's how you successfully navigate the course, which is your life. You don't have the privilege of choosing the course, but you do have the privilege of finishing it. And if you keep the faith, it's going to work out great for you. Because then, point number three, you get to await the reward. You get to await your reward. Look at verse 8. Henceforth, because of this, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. You see, this is where we get to say it was worth it all. Now, it was worth it all even without the rewards. Because God's worth it, no matter what. 
But this is how good God is. In his loving kindness, he has seen fit to reward our service to him. And it's for all those that love his appearing, which means all those who are ready for his return. Which again, you prove by verse 7. And then a crown of righteousness is waiting. And there are a couple of things here I want to point out. First of all, I want you to notice that this reward is laid up, right? It says there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. That means it is reserved. That is why we are to lay up treasures in heaven, according to Matthew 6.20. So as great as heaven will be, heaven is not the reward. It's just a gift. Getting to go to heaven is a gift that he gives to all of his children, faithful or not. And praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that gift. So that means that Christians who have died have not gone to their reward, not yet. They've gone to heaven. They're in the presence of the Lord. No one has gone to their reward yet because it's laid up in reserve to be distributed at the judgment seat. It's warehouse until we're all there together. And this is important to understand. So Paul will not get his until we get ours. And I also want you to notice that this reward represents rulership because it's a crown. And we're going to talk more about that on Saturday morning when we look at our inheritance in the millennium. But there's a crown of righteousness here in our passage for those who love is appearing, proved by sacrificial living in service to the king. And like I said, a crown represents rulership that will apply during the millennium. And suffice it to say, whatever you do, you don't want to be bareheaded in heaven. You're going to want a crown. And here's how it will be conferred. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give. It is personally conferred or bestowed by the judge. That means it's coming at the judgment seat. So I want you to put a picture again in your mind. And, and, and this is why it's important to understand that, that, that those rewards are laid up. And, and they're warehoused when we're all going to get them at the same time at the judgment seat of Christ. So I want you to put a picture in your mind, and, and, and if you can't think of it, think, think like this. Think of some of the commonwealth countries, right, so that have, have monarchies and, and kings. So if you lived in England, for example, maybe you'd be able to picture the judgment seat of Christ. And there's a royal throne, and if you were being awarded something, you would kneel down at the bottom step and bow and then the monarch would knight you, and you'd get a sword or a medal, a proclamation, a title, a crown. It's the honor of service, a life lived for the country. But think about seeing Jesus on the throne and bowing at his feet and then receiving a reward from the only righteous judge that has ever existed, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he bestows crowns for a life lived in service to him with Paul, with everybody, this coming from the one who poured out his life for you and now he's rewarding you. How humbling, how incredible that will be. But listen on the flip side. Can you imagine the anguish of some Christians when others get crowns and they get none? And what shame there will be in that day. Because the fact is, you can await your reward only if you've met the requirements for the reward. And for those that don't meet the requirements, they just won't have anything. And it will be apparent to all. But you won't have an argument because he's the righteous judge. And let's not mess that up. 
especially now, especially in these last days. 2 John verse 8 says, Look to yourself that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. What a shame if you don't have a crown. Well, let's finish the course that God has given us, and we're going to talk about it tomorrow night. We're going to talk about what that means. But listen, it won't matter how well you did in the first 100 yards if you don't finish the race. And anything you win today can be lost tomorrow if you backslide, if you throw in the towel. So if you want something to live for, a cause to fight for, a race to run in, a treasure to guard, then go to the doorpost. Because you want that day to be a day of rejoicing, not a day of sorrow. And there's a hymn titled, Oh, I Want to See Him. It's an old hymn. The chorus goes, Oh, I want to see him, to look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. All my cares are past, home at last, ever to rejoice. And listen, my prayer tonight is that we do all that we can so that we are ready when we see him. That we love his appearing, that we obey his word and give our life to him in submission to all that he says and all that he asks of us. So let me ask you one more time. Are you ready? Are you ready?